Our God has blessed us with another wonderful day, and we are thankful that we have the opportunity to be together again to give our worship unto Him. I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to be talking about the account that was read for us here just a moment ago, and I want to share a lesson with you that I've entitled, What Lack I Yet? That was the question of this young man who comes to Jesus. You know, as we read these things, we see this individual approaching our Lord. And in Mark's account, we're told that he ran to meet Jesus. And when he gets there, he falls down at the feet of Jesus and he worships him. And then he asks this all-important question. What good thing do I need to do in order to have eternal life? Now, Jesus begins by talking about the way this individual had addressed him. He called him good master. Jesus really takes this opportunity to point out that there is one who is good. That is God and really, in saying this, he is saying that this young man, in addressing him in this way, good master, understands that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God with us. He truly is the good master. And so, he tells this individual, you keep the commandments. I know sometimes people think that keeping commandments, that doesn't have anything to do with, with your salvation. Jesus didn't think that. Jesus would teach that we need to follow the commandments God has given if we want to have eternal life. And that was true under the Old Covenant, and it's true under the New Testament that we live under today. This man responded by saying, which of the commandments? Jesus then explained, the commandments God has given. You're not to murder, you're not to commit adultery, not to steal, not to bear false witness, honor your mother and father, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, when you look at that list, we see that Jesus included all the commandments that deal with our relationships with each other, except for one. You know which one's missing? The one that says, thou shalt not covet. Do you suppose Jesus knew exactly what this young man's problem was? Jesus knows our heart, doesn't he? And he knew what kept this man from eternal life. And so the man is able to say, I I've kept all of these from my youth up. What lack I yet? This is a man who has a good heart, evidently. He is a moral individual to be able to say, I I've done this from the time I was a child. And yet he's perceptive. He knew there was something still lacking, still missing. And so he asked the question, what lack I yet? Jesus would tell him to go and sell all that he had and give it to the poor and come follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Now, that's, that's a pretty hard request, isn't it? What if Jesus said that to us? Does he say that to us? As followers of Christ, do we have to sell all that we have and give it to the poor and then come follow him? Well, well no, we don't. In the New Testament, we read of Christians, faithful Christians who owned property, who had houses, who had money. And so we know that Christians were not told to do this. Many think that perhaps this young man was being asked to do exactly what the apostles had done. Maybe he was being called by Christ to be with the twelve because they had forsaken all and followed after him. Jesus knows what is keeping this man from salvation. And the Bible, of course, tells us that he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. He wasn't willing to do 
the one thing that would have brought him eternal life. But that question that he asked, that's the question that I want each of us to ask of ourselves this morning. Whether you are a Christian or whether you're one who has not yet put on Christ, what lack I yet? Are there things in my life that I need to change so that I can become a a better servant unto the Lord? The kind of servant that I need to be. What lack I yet? Or is there something that's keeping me from obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ? Being baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. What lack I yet? I have seven questions for us this morning. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about these things, but I believe that these questions are things that perhaps many of us struggle with. Maybe they're things that we lack in our lives that we know needs to change. And so with that in mind, let, let's look at ourselves, examine ourselves this morning as we study together from God's Word and And consider this question, what lack I yet? Here's the first. Do I lack knowledge? Is that what is keeping me from being the servant of God that that I know I should be? Or is that what's keeping me from obeying the gospel? I I just don't know enough. You know, I, I want you to understand. It's not wrong to lack knowledge. Because all of us have been in that situation before. There were things we didn't know that we needed to know. It's not wrong to lack knowledge. It is wrong to continue in that state. All of us in Christ begin as, as babes. And that's fine. That's the way the Bible describes us. But folks, after years and years and years, if we stay spiritual babes... There's a problem. It's always been curious to me that when a congregation has a class on first principles, it will be filled up with people who have been Christians for 30, 40, maybe even 50 years. Now, maybe some of them are going there to support others. That's good. But if it's learning the ABCs again... There's a problem, isn't there? And folks, when it comes to obeying the gospel, sometimes people say, well, I I just don't know enough. I understand that. Christianity is a taught religion. You're not born into it by physical birth. You have to be taught what you need to do. We see example of that in the scriptures. In Acts chapter 16, you remember... Paul and Silas in that prison in Philippi. They're singing and praying at midnight and there's that great earthquake that throws open all the gates of the jail and all the bonds of the prisoners that they're released. There's a jailer who is about to take his own life when Paul stops him from doing so by saying, we're we're all here. And that's when this man comes to Paul and to Silas. And he says to them, verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31 says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You would think, the way that the world teaches this event, that that's where the the account stops. The chapter stops. But folks, it's just right in the middle of the chapter. People want to say, All you need to do is believe. This man didn't know what to believe. There's a good chance he had never heard of Jesus Christ until that night when Paul and Silas were singing about him, where they were praying unto him. He didn't know what to believe. So what has to happen? He has to be taught. Verse 31, or verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. They teach him. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He, in all his straightway, 
they learned what they needed to know in order to obey the gospel. Now, I realize it might be the case that someone might not know what they need to do. This man didn't. But do you notice how long it took for him to learn? The same hour of the night. Midnight's when that earthquake happened. It took less than an hour for Paul and Silas to teach them what they needed to know in order to become New Testament Christians. Some will say, I, maybe I, I just don't know enough. If we lack knowledge, there is a good answer to that. Let's learn. Let's be taught. And if you're here this morning, you're not, not a Christian, and you want to learn what God would have you to do, talk to one of the members of this congregation, because what we would love is to be able to sit down with you and to show you from God's precious word exactly what he would have us to do so that you can have the life that's found in Christ as well. Don't be like some people. My dad was telling me this week about an individual who is, he, he's passed away now. But my dad spoke to him about trying to share the gospel with him. And he said to him, Jimmy, I, 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 I tell you what, I, I just don't want to. I figure, off, I, I figure out I, I'm, I'm better off just not knowing. God's not going to hold me accountable for what I don't know. Folks, that's not a biblical idea at all. We are accountable. And this idea of lacking knowledge, there is a, a way to address that. Let's learn what God would have us to do. And let's keep growing as Christians. What lack I yet? Here's question number two. Do I lack hope? Do I lack hope? I talk to people at different times about their souls. And some of them have given up hope. They, they express it this way. I, I just don't know that God could save me. I just don't know that the Lord could forgive me. Preacher, you don't know what I've done or how wicked I have been in my life, how many times I've sinned. I, I just don't think the Lord could forgive me. They lack hope. But again, the Bible provides the answer for us. One of the most encouraging passages that you find in Scripture is in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 15 and 16 where the Apostle Paul is able to write, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. What Paul's saying is, I'm an example. I'm a pattern of the great power of the gospel. And my friend, if God can forgive me, if Christ can forgive me, the chief of sinners, he can forgive you. Oh, it's encouraging. No matter the magnitude nor the multitude of our sins, the blood of Christ can take our sins away. Do you lack hope? God's Word gives us every reason to have hope because He gives us the assurance of forgiveness if we will obey His will. Here's question number three. Do I lack perspective? Is that what is keeping me from being the servant of God that he would have me to be, that I, that I know that I ought to be? Or is it what's keeping me from obeying his will? Do I, do I lack that proper perspective? You know, the idea of perspective is, is how you look at things. And if we lack the proper perspective, then we're not looking at things the right way. Our focus isn't where it ought to be. Our, our focus is upon here and now instead of upon the spiritual. It's on the physical. We're not thinking about what is to come, where we're all going. And you know, it's easy to fall into that trap, isn't it? The cares of this world, 
They have a way of just kind of choking out God's word, don't they? In fact, that's what Jesus talked about in, in the parable of the sower. There was good seed that was sown, and there were thorns there, and those thorns choked out God's word, so it couldn't be fruitful. And he would explain that those thorns, at least some of them, are the cares of this world. We don't have a proper perspective. We have the wrong focus as we go through life. You know, Jesus addressed that in Luke chapter 12. There was a man who came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Back then, there was a great deal of emphasis, emphasis put upon the idea of being the firstborn. And if you were the firstborn and there are just two of you, when that came to dividing the inheritance, it wasn't 50-50. The oldest got two-thirds. The youngest just got one-third. And evidently, this one was the younger, and he didn't like that situation. And so he, he says, make him divide it with me. But Jesus would respond by saying, take heed. And beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. How often do we make that mistake? That we think that's what life is all about. You ever do this with your phones? Don't do it now. But you ever see someone on television, an actor or athlete, a musician, whatever it may, and it pops in your head, wonder how much they're worth. And so you, you look it up or you ask, you know, what's their net worth? And it comes up $40 million, $100 million, a $1 billion, whatever it is. Don't look up mine because I don't think they give negatives. But is that really the value of a person? Jesus says, no, that, that's not it. And that's not what really matters in life. Jesus would then go on and give us a parable. It's a parable about a man who had a lot of land. And that land brought forth abundant fruit, so much so that his barns couldn't hold it all. And so he sits down and he thinks, what am I going to do? And he, he has this realization, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down those old barns and I'm going to build greater ones and I'm going to store all these goods and I am going to sit down and I am going to say, soul, eat, drink, and be merry because you've got it made for years to come. You know what bothers me about that parable? Almost sounds like the American dream. I want to get to a point where I don't have to do anything. I can just sit back and relax and not do anything. Jesus said that God had said that man was a fool because that night his soul would be required of him. Then who would all these things go to? Jesus then closed the parable by saying, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I always like the story about the rich man who took his friend up on the top of his house. And he said, you know, every direction you look, I own as far as you can see. And his friend looked around for a little bit. And then he said, how much do you own in that direction? What about us? Are we rich toward God? Do we have the proper perspective? Are we thinking about what is to come? Or is our focus just on the here and now? Have we made the preparation we need to make? Do I lack perspective? Here's our next question. Do I lack humility? Is that what is keeping me from being the servant that God wants me to be? Or, or is that what's keeping me from obeying the will of God? Do I lack humility? When it comes to this kind of question, really what we're asking is, am I a person who's filled with pride, who says, I'm going to do it my way? You know, so many people in this life 
go through life with that kind of attitude. I'm my own boss. No one is going to tell me what to do. And again, you almost see that idea with kind of tied in with being Americans, right? I mean, we fly a flag with that snake on it. It says, don't tread on me. Don't tell me what to do. Now, I, I understand that not everyone who flies that flag has that attitude. And there's a lot more that goes into that than, than just the idea of pride. I, I'm not trying to say that at all. But there are some who have that idea as they go through life, right? I'm going to do it my way. That's what Frank Sinatra's saying. Is that our pride? I'm just going to do it my way. I, what I think is right. I don't have enough humility to submit to the will of God. I'm going to do what I think is right. You know, in Luke chapter 9, in verses 23 and 24, Jesus would say, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake the same shall save it. Do we lack humility? Are we willing to put God's will ahead of our own and submit unto him? Or is that what's keeping us from surrendering unto him? How about this next question? Do I lack urgency? Do I understand how important it really is for me to obey the gospel and to grow as a Christian now, today. You ever get that response when you talk to people about their soul? One of these days, or I'm going to get around to it. You know, I, I understand that that's right, and I, I'm going to do it sometime. Folks, that's a person that doesn't understand the, the urgency of obeying the gospel. Do you realize that every person in the Bible that we read about obeying the gospel did it immediately. They never waited. They didn't eat. They didn't sleep before they obeyed the gospel. They didn't say, we're going to wait till Sunday. Or I'm going to wait till my grandpa can be here. Or I, I'm going to wait till I get back home. No, they did it right then. Every person that hesitated, we never read of them obeying the gospel. There's an urgency that's involved in obeying the will of God. In Acts 8 and verse 36, you have Philip teaching that Ethiopian eunuch. And here's what happens. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? I long for the day when I'm preaching a sermon and somebody stands up and says, Preacher, can we just stop for a minute so I can be baptized? You know what I, I'd say? Sit back down. You wait till I finish. No. No. I remember studying with a lady and we got to about it was a five lesson series that we were going through. And we were in lesson three and about the middle of it, she said, um, Tim, do I have to wait till we go through all five of these to be baptized? I, no, you don't. We stopped the lesson right there. We were at the building. We, we baptized her and then we continued on with the lesson. There's an urgency that is involved in understanding our need to obey the gospel. Do I lack that? Is that what's keeping me from obeying the will of God? Just a couple more questions for our study this morning. What lack I yet? Do I lack fear? You know, we think a lot of times that's a great quality. Someone who has no fear. You ever see that bumper sticker? No fear. My mom always says after that, no sense. 
Fear, fear can be a pretty good thing. I was just reading last night about going to the Grand Canyon. Some of you have been there. I have never been. Do you know that every year, three to four people die at the Grand Canyon by accidentally falling in? All the warnings, but they get off the path anyway. Or they hang over the rail. Got to get a picture, you know. Some people have filmed their own deaths trying to do something for YouTube. No fear. When I was looking last night about that, it it said the Grand Canyon is not Disneyland. But sometimes people have no fear. I'm not afraid. Folks, if we're not afraid of the punishment that God has said will come to those who fail to obey his will, there's something wrong with our thinking. That ought to scare us to death. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 7 through 9, Paul would write and say, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and look, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't mind telling you, that one of the major things that led me to obey the gospel was the idea, I don't want to go to hell. Now, I believe as a Christian that I have grown and I appreciate more and more the love of God and want to obey Him because He loves me more than just the idea of fear. But does that motivate me? Yes. Do we lack fear? Or how about this last? Is it because I lack love? What lack I yet? Do we really love God? Do we really love the Lord? You know, those are easy things to say. Yes, I I love the Lord. How do you show the love of God? John tells us in the book of 1 John, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. They're for our good. Do we love him the way that we should? And will that love lead us to obey him and lead us to grow to be the servants he wants us to be? We have to be careful that our love is, is not misplaced. John writes in 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Let's not love anything more than we love our God. Certainly not this world. Because the sinful things of this world, they all will pass. What lack I yet? That was the question that this rich young ruler asked Jesus. And when he was given the answer, he went away sorrowful. I don't want a single soul to go away sorrowful today. Ask yourself the question, what lack I yet? Christian, are there things lacking? Then let's, let's change that. And let's become the servants God wants us to be. It's going to require great effort on our part. Diligence. But oh, how wonderful it will be to every day grow closer to our Lord. And my friend, if you're not yet a Christian, what is it that you lack? Don't let anything stand between you and your obedience to the gospel. Don't be like this young man who went away sorrowful. Let's make this the day you go on your way rejoicing as a child of God, having obeyed his will. And so if you need to obey the gospel, being baptized for the remission of your sins, take that step. If you're one who has obeyed, but maybe you've fallen away and and you need to come back, We want to pray with you.
and for you. What lack I yet? Let's all think about that. And if we're subject in any way to heaven's invitation, let's respond as together we stand and as we sing.